Is it working? Yeah, we're good. What's up, people? Happy Friday. Got Kenneth Kelsey in the house. Santa Cruz. The whiskey friend, Alan, how you doing? Justin did so. Victor Galliardi. Cash how you doing? Jason Coach. Amy. How you doing, darling? Mark Brown's in the house. Moji Chun. Insectia. Kevin Miato. Rob Davy. Cool. Mini release. Finishing up. First week of Isla Month. Alrighty. Alrighty. So, hey, I want to thank everyone for uh, tuning in. For those who tuned in last night, because I accidentally posted this for uh, yesterday, last night, I want to apologize uh, for those who left. Uh, uh, or sent me an email from last night. Um, I just spilled all over my mouse pad. Um, got something going to you in, in the mail. Uh, so I'm doing Isla Month. This has been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of work. Uh, I've been, uh, been really enjoying some fantastic whiskeys. A few unicorns that are hard to find, but really, really enjoying them. Uh, Mashing Drum, uh, Jason, very much. Eb, Eb, Ebhead is in the house. Bourbon Sane is in the house. Um, and this first week just been really art bag heavy. Uh, and then we'll be transitioning into uh, Lagavulin tomorrow, Saturday, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, 11 p.m. UK time. Um, Going to be posting a premiere, uh, The Whiskey Friend, and or Alan, and I, we recorded a video together. We did the Lagavulin 12. He had the 17. I had the 16. The, it's a one-hour premiere. It'll post uh, tomorrow. I will put the official video up after this. Um, you can't have two announcements up at the same time. Um, again, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, and eight hours after. Or that'll be 11 o'clock p.m. Uh, in the UK, Europe, or on that time. We had a fantastic time, a really good time getting to know them. Uh, fantastic whiskeys. I'm going to do an independent uh, review of uh, the 2016 Lagavulin 12. Um, that'll come on uh, later uh, next week. So you're going to want to tune in that, and hopefully both Alan and I will be able to join everyone in the chat and interact with you all. We had a lot of fun. Uh, Alan's a real hoot, and hope everyone uh, gets to know him and go to his channel a little bit uh, better. So I'm sort of doing something a little new, different, um, going themes, the whole month of uh, Isla. Next month, I'm doing bourbon. I'm lined up a bunch of guests uh, for next month. I have one slot open for a Friday uh, for a bourbon guest. I'm still looking for someone. I'm still hoping to have Jason Whiskey Wise. He's a little under the weather uh, right now, um, but he and I were supposed to do a Bunnohaven together, which will be later this month. Hopefully, we'll still be able to do it, um, but we'll see how that goes. There's so many variables, things that can go wrong when you're doing pl making planning. People have, they get sick, they, they got work, they got their family, technology, whatever else, things can go wrong, but hopefully that will work out. And Jason, Whiskey Wise, if you're watching this later on, uh, brother, I hope you're feeling a lot better soon. Um, Ardbeg, my favorite, pop, my favorite Isla distillery. Second to that is uh, Lagavulin. I love visiting. Uh, Ardbeg, I am a bit of a fanboy, as you can probably see by my collection uh, over there. So tonight, joining me, uh, my first, actually my second guest for uh, Isla Month last week, I got together with uh, Bill, the Whiskey Dick, uh, down in San Diego. We, it's two and a half hour live stream. We had a, a fantastic time. We spent another hour and a half or so getting together. We, we had dinner afterwards. Uh, we could have gone on all night long, but we just had a really, really good time. 
Uh, and then I went to the whiskey house after that. Uh, that was awesome. Anyway, so we're going to stop at the top of the hour because after this, uh, the whiskey dick and Burb Insane will be going live on the whiskey dicks channel and they're going to be doing bourbon. So you're going to want to check uh, him out. This Sunday is actually International Scotch Day. This Sunday is International Scotch Day. March 27th, which is a Wednesday, is International Whiskey Day. I'm currently interacting with uh, Jason uh, C. Uh, the Mash and Drum. Uh, even though it's in the middle of the week, schedule-wise, it can be a little hassle, but hopefully we're going to set up a, invite a bunch of lineup, get, get a bunch of people to do whiskeys on International Whiskey Day. Uh, I know it's in the middle of the week. People got to work and so forth, so it, it can make, make it a hassle. But hopefully we can get some people in Europe and the UK to join us to cover sort of the uh, morning hours. I will be going on at 5 o'clock. Jason would go on it, then his uh, 5 o'clock Pacific, then Jason would go on his normal time, uh, 6 or 9 o'clock. But that's another month from now, but uh, we're looking forward to that. All righty. So uh, Jeremy from uh, Sipper Social Club, why don't you say hello? Eric, thank you very much for having me. Love the idea of the Isla Month. I mean, it's right in my wheelhouse. As you can see, I'm a big art bag fan as well. Um, I'm actually sipping something that might interest you. This is my art bag 10 year old homebrew, the exact same setup that I did for that um, the sample I sent you. This one is also really good. I'll have to send you a sample of this as well. This stuff is really, really nice. So same setup, the port barrel finished, art bag 10 year old. It's delicious stuff. I'm loving it. Uh, man, I can now go on a completely different route, and we just want to talk about that rather than the dark. <laughs> I'm really, really curious. So, if you guys haven't seen it, so Jeremy um, is playing uh, home uh, master blender. He gets gets the little barrels. He seasons them. He did. You've done like five now. Yeah, I've done uh, six. 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 Okay. That, yeah. The um, the most recent one I think was my sixth one. So yeah. So, so the one you sent me, was that your fifth or was that your sixth? That would be my sixth. That was the most recent one that I've done, yeah. Okay, so if you guys haven't seen that, I'll, I'll put a link down below later. I really, 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 really enjoyed it. I really liked it. Um, I liked watching your video because the temptation is to do a before and after video and really, really long. Watch all, You really edit it really, really well. And so you got the, the stages really, really quick. So it all lined up and you kind of get, even if I'm not going to do that, I got a big picture of understanding the whole process. I thought you did it really, really well. And uh, you were gracious enough to send me a sample. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I see Loch Ness in the chat. He also won a sample too. So I got, like I said, that uh, send it off to him. But um, from everyone that's tried it, gotten great feedback. Um, I think it's my best work yet. Um, okay. I think it's even better than this art bag. But I'll send you the art bag and let you try it for yourself awesome. and see. I actually didn't win. I just whined and complained that they didn't give me one. Right, you didn't win. I, yeah, you did. <laughs> you said, oh, too bad I didn't win. I would have loved to like, review this on my channel. So, yeah, it was a sympathy. I sent you a sympathy pour. Man, that guy really is a whiner. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we're getting into this tonight, eh? A little Dark Cove. Oh. I'm going to pour some out. You know, the thing is, this is my favorite art bag. We're finishing up essentially what's art bag week uh, out of the first you know, fourth of other month, and I can't think of a better way to do it than with my favorite art bag because this is this is an awesome, awesome, awesome whiskey. Now, this one for me, when I first cracked my bottle, I wasn't in love with it. I've got it down to about here now, and now it is just perfect. Like before the shoulder hit, I didn't like it really that much at all. It had this weird kind of oaky tannin note that um has since been kind of diminished, but now it's just it's just perfect, I think, now. So my so I have two bottles. Mine is just slightly higher than yours. I like it at first, but I like it a lot more now. Yeah. Uh, I like it a lot more now. The weird thing, I just put it to my nose, and I'm getting something different than the last time I remember. I'm getting just a hint, and again, I haven't tasted it, a hint of like a maple syrup kind of a character, which I, I, I didn't get before. It's, it's kind of weird that like that power of suggesting because like, as soon as you said maple syrup, I'm like, oh yeah, there's maple syrup in there. <laughs> I'm getting some uh, schnozberry. Just a little, <laughs> bit of, a little bit of schnozberry. All right. I, mean, I think I think what I like about this is like the sherry influence in here. Um, if you like verse like take it versus like uh, the Yugadel, for example, much I think I always want to say that there's older sherry whiskey in this versus the Yugadel. So I was doing a little comparison the other day. And this one definitely better shared whiskey in the in the dark cove for sure than the Yukodel. 
Well, this one's, uh, if I recall correctly, a little higher ABV as well. Um, well, yeah, I mean, the committee release, 55% ABV. Um, you could know the regular 46, and no, right. sorry, 54.2. Okay. So almost the same ABV, almost the same. So let me ask you, So I, we do a little sipping, a little drinking, a little talking. So um, I get to know about your you and your channel through Rob, Whiskey in the Six. And I don't see his name up here. Or maybe, he's, oh, maybe he's busy with the family or something. Oh, you know, Friday, I just remember, because we've had this conversation. Family for him, Friday for him is more of a family night and date right. night, that kind of thing with, 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 with his wife. Because so I've tried to have him on on Fridays, and that day, you know, that it's pretty much booked. And family has to come first. So I get to know you or introduce to you through him. And then, but you didn't have a channel right away. And then you started a, a channel up, uh, later, right? Yeah, so I started kind of like my whiskey reviewing uh, for Toronto Whiskey Society. They have a website. Um, I was posting just written reviews there starting in around 2016. Um, always kind of thought about doing a YouTube channel. I uh, just kind of went with that media to start. And then, of course, met Rob um, through various channels and started doing lives on with him, doing reviews with him. And um, he kind of pushed me to the edge along with like my girlfriend just being like, you should do it, you should definitely do it. And I was like, well, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of time, a lot of editing, um, and a lot of money to like spend on, you know, buying bottles to review. So I was like, all right, I did it. And then, um, yeah, it's been a pretty good success so far. Lots of positive feedback. So I'm really happy that uh, that I went through with it. Now you guys somewhat neighbors or live close enough to each other you could share bottles pretty easily? Yeah, Rob lives about uh, about 25 to 30 minute drive uh, from me. Okay. I'm kind of more like downtown core. He's kind of off in the north of Toronto. Okay. Yeah. So um, the back of the book. So before you were doing your YouTube uh, channel, you were writing for, you say, was it a blog or a website? Yeah, it's a website, um, Toronto Whiskey Society, okay. um, kind of a group of guys that got together. They kind of met on uh, on Reddit. They were all doing reviews on there. Um, and they realized they were all kind of localized here in Toronto. They started a group, a whiskey group. They just got together, started doing um, tastings, and then kind of branched out and kind of collected more members in the GTA, uh, Greater Toronto Area, and in Toronto itself. And um, I met them through there, started reviewing for their site, and then um, went to YouTube. So most people know my story you know i've been into wine for 20 years back into that april 2016 studying for a w set exam when the units was on spirits i was not into spirits i had no desire to get into spirits um but i had to it was one of the units so i had to take it and then fell in love with uh the mccollum 12 then it which i gave 95 points <laughs> yeah i remember that i remember i remember the scene that review and i'm like wow 95 it doesn't leave uh, much room for the older mccallums <laughs> <laughs> well you know <laughs> it's you know, I, I one time like Michael Bolton singing opera too. <laughs> <laughs> I so, mean, I love the Macallan Twelve, the Sherry. I mean, that's that's one of my favorite whiskeys uh, for sure. But you know, you know, when you really, really, I was really highly impressed by the first thing I'd ever had and and liked. You know, I I was probably in high school. A friend and I probably rated his his dad's liquor cabinet. I had something super peaty, and I didn't like it. I thought it it, it tasted like something out of a a rain gutter with leaves in it. You know. So I really like that. So obviously I went really high with points and so forth. Um, but anyway, so so I've only been doing whiskeys coming up on three years. Um, but I've really just pedaled to the metal, been focused on whiskey, read a ton of books, done tons of traveling, Scotland, all over California and, and, and Kentucky. And and it just really to the grindstone. So how long? So some people have wine background, beer background, or just some other – uh, came in and introduced uh, to whiskey. So how did you get into whiskey and how long have you been into whiskey? Um, I guess I've been seriously into whiskey for, I want to say five years now. Um, before that, my dad was a big drinker of um, Canadian whiskey. So we'd always have the Staples Crown Royal, Canadian Club, Weiser's, all that kind of stuff was always around in the house. And I would always kind of like tap into it when I needed to kind of thing. Um, but it wasn't really until I started drinking bourbon is when I kind of got like the whiskey bug. I think my first decent bourbon that I had that kind of like flipped the light switch was a Knob Creek uh, single barrel or the nine-year-old. I can't remember one of the one of the two. 
And um, I just remember that bourbon being so good and so different than like a Canadian whiskey or anything else I'd had before. And then we kind of moved into the scotch. It was really cool because a, a couple of my close friends from from high school and from college kind of got together and started just a kind of a little whiskey club. And we started each kind of buying a bottle and bringing it together and kind of sharing and, and kind of started with that Knob Creek and kind of went from there. And then I can't remember the first scotch I got into. I remember my first pita scotch. It was uh, it was um, Lafroy quarter cask. I mean, you never you never forget that. Yeah, your first so, Lafroy, you can't, that's a little it sticks in your head. <laughs> I remember it tasting like road, and I'm like tar, and I'm like this is different. Um, I wasn't loving it the first time I tried it, but I wasn't hating it either. I was very very curious about how this spirit kind of like got those flavors, and then from there it just escalated, and I spent all my money on scotch. And uh, now I'm here. So my dad, he liked Michelob beer. So he, beer on weekends, you know, with, a, with pizza. And then late in his life, he got into Kendall Jackson Chardonnay. But that was it. Very narrow. You know, my dad, he grew, he was a Navy brat, so he moved around a lot. So once he bought a house in 1967, he didn't go anywhere, didn't want to go anywhere, wasn't going to move, you know, just put his roots, roots in. He went to a restaurant. He'd always eat the same thing. Uh, beer. He always, he always wanted Michelob, and then Chardonnay. He always wanted Kendall Jackson. He liked wines that I would bring, but you know, pretty much he's kind of stuck to his thing. Uh, his music tastes were very narrow. Everything was, you know, kind of. And I'm like the polar opposite. I'm very eclectic in my music. I like to travel. I like to run around. I'm very diverse in my whiskey and my wines and everything else. Um, what about you? Where are you in terms of your spectrum? In terms of what you like? What your favor? uh and, and your range of your interest in, in exploration of whiskeys um so whiskeys i'm gonna say like scotch first and foremost i would always lean towards scotch uh bourbon kind of comes in right behind it um world whiskeys kind of fit into there somewhere along the line like i'm a big fan of Cav cavalan um all those soulless bottles i've loved all every single one i've tried um and then I'd say like Canadian whiskey kind of brings up the rear. I'm not really big in Canadian whiskey. Um, it really hasn't been till recently where there's been some decent Canadian whiskey, like the Lot 40 cast strength coming out, kind of stuff like that. That's, you know, putting Canadian whiskey more on the level of bourbon and scotch and stuff like that. So definitely scotch whiskey. Um, peated whiskey, I think is probably my favorite, but I'm also a sucker for like a nice sherry cast too. So. I like the the wide variety of Scotch brings, right? You can get anything from like just a nice ex bourbon matured whiskey to some sherry stuff to some peated stuff. I mean, the whole range of the spectrum is just is just awesome. So I love exploring that bourbon. Um, definitely love a good bourbon too. Um, I'd say bourbon for me is more on a night where I want to just sit back and maybe not you know dissect a whiskey as much. Maybe I'll pour a bourbon. You know, if I'm watching a hockey game, I love sipping bourbon watching hockey. Um, and yeah, that's that's kind of where my range is. And then craft beer. I'm into craft beer. Toronto has some awesome uh, craft uh, breweries here. Really, really good stuff. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it where my alcohol kind of spectrum is. Don't drink clear spirits. Um, I have one bottle of vodka in my bar. And it's for making Caesars or as you Americans call it, uh, Bloody Marys, I guess. So just I want to make couple, say hello to a couple of people. Uh, Rob Davey uh, dropped in, and he says his dad only drinks Coors, Coors Light. Lochness is in the house. Uh, Hoyt Hemphill is in the house. Go Habs is in the house. And Craig F., he says his dad only drinks Clan McGregor or vodka. And Chad Adams is in the house. Hey, Chad, how you doing? So, um, so, so I have friends in the wine world. They're kind of like, for exams, they've had to drink other wines. They have to study other wine regions, and they know them. But it's always Pinot or Pinot, or and more specifically Burgundy, 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 or they're Riesling, 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 or Bordeaux, Bordeaux. You know, that's they're kind of very narrow in their uh, in their interest. So the others they've gotten to know because they have to for exams, but they they don't have a, a an interest in. It, let alone, and I've I've almost like lost touch with a lot of my Somali friends. Because they had to get to know whiskeys and, and cocktails for exams, but they don't have a zeal for it the way I do. I, I, I tend to have this dual passion of both uh, whiskeys and wines, although whiskeys, because it's newer to me and it's a new place of uh, exploration, um, 
I'm spending more, much more time on it uh, because I've spent 20 years in wine. Um, but very few people seem to be, I, I think, as eclectic, as broad, um, and have dual passions. But then I don't play golf. I'm not into beer. I don't follow hockey. I don't care about politics. So if I got to narrow my interest down to two, I, I think I pick, uh, pick pretty uh, two, two good ones. And the, I want to say hello to the alchemist as well. So are you kind of like maybe like an outcast now since you went from the world of like wine sommelier to like whiskey. Now all your like hardcore sommelier friends are like, forget about Eric. He's a, a traitor. He's gone to the dark side, you know. Well, they haven't officially um, uh, declared me anathema <laughs> <laughs> and led me to the to the gates of the city. But, right. <laughs> <laughs> but so the last four years, I, like I worked at the for the Institute of Masters of Wine, I worked there Bordeaux tasting in San Francisco, and this year I was not invited. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It's starting. You're getting. You're getting. You're getting barred. <laughs> but but I have on the business side in terms of consulting. That's still clicking along. Um, I don't talk about it much, but I get I have a few wineries that regularly contact me, want me to try samples, give, give my impression of uh, barrel samples and how they're doing blends, and and ask me for advice about this, that, and the other thing. Um, so I still do that off and on, but that's sort of uh, under the radar, and they don't even know about my uh, whiskey interest. They're not part of. They're more of just the winery rather than the sommelier world. Sure. So now, do you have, so, what, so you said your first peated was. Lafroig um quarter cask. Quarter cask. Yeah. So do you have a favorite in terms of peated? Like I'm I'm my first is probably Ardbeg and then I go Lagavulin. Yeah, you know, um for me it's Brooklady, like the Octomore range. Absolutely love those whiskeys. Um the new Port Charlotte MCO1. Absolutely awesome, awesome stuff. I love like the farm kind of notes you get from that. Um the sweetness. I think the good thing about why I like uh, Brook Lottie a lot is it seems like nowadays these sherry casts are so high demand, so high priced, and they go out and they find these like wine casts that you maybe haven't really heard of that much, and their spirit just works perfectly with them, and it just it just works so well at a, such a young age. Like their whiskey at five to ten years is so good. Um, so definitely Brook Lottie is my like favorite distillery at this point, I think, and the Octomore support Charlotte's absolutely love those whiskeys for sure. It's funny. So I had the only time I tasted the Octomores was actually at the distillery. But you're tasting so many wiki wikis, so many whiskeys day after day. You don't have like a clear memory of them. You need to set up, sit with them by your by yourself, away from everything else. So I'm having um, uh, uh, Keith from the Molten Man Cave on uh, when we get to Brooklady. So I got us both a bottle of the Octomore 8.1, um, which I've got sitting back here somewhere. Anyway. So I thought, you know, before we go on live, I should taste a little bit. And I don't want to spoil anything because in a couple of weeks, Keith and I will begin together. But, oh, my goodness. Uh, usually talking about the neck pour. You got to get beyond the neck. Got to get down the middle. That right off, right out the gate, man. Boom. That's a kill, absolutely stellar killer whiskey. Yeah, it's it's crazy with the Octomores because, like, the PPM level is so, so high. Like, it's higher than, you know, any other peated whiskey. Yet the smokiness, the peatiness – it doesn't necessarily just translate to like something that's just going to blow your socks off peat. I mean, of course there's a lot, a lot of peat influence, but it just like, it seems like it just fits perfectly. Like it's so well balanced with all their whiskeys. I don't know how to do it over there. It's, it's magic. That distillery. I love it. Well, one of the things, and uh, again, I'm always about reading and researching and listening and, and not just one source, multiple sources, because if not everybody agrees on everything. So the P if your PPM level is measured, prior to uh, fermentation, that doesn't necessarily translate that all of that is going to make it uh, its way out on the other end of the still and uh, out of the barrels. So you could have two whiskeys at the same PPM level, but because of the way they're doing fermentations and everything else, one may, one may maintain more of that smokiness character than the other, uh, and the other and another one may be more integrated with the rest of the character of, of the whiskey. So it's it's not as prominent. So, right. so yeah. the Ard, like the Ardbeg Perpetuum, uh, for example, that I recently reviewed, it's probably the same PPM as a lot of the Ardbegs, and yet it seems the most peaty and smoky and ashy up front. And I think it's just because it's not, at least not up from the neck, 
quite as balanced as some of the art. I mean, I like it, and it get it, you know it gets a little more balanced as you get towards the uh, in the middle, but it's much more like that Laphroaig ten like uh, coming out of the gate. Yeah, and I think I just saw a comment. Um, Eric Gilbert in the chat says the magic of the cut level, and I think that has to do with it. Well, like you take your cut on the head and on the tail, kind of that affects you know the overall uh, effect of the smokiness in the whiskey as well. Right. There's something, you know, Chris Owens, going back to the wine world, you can have two different wines, both give a new oak uh, and ye in terms of and, and similar yeast and everything else. But there are other decisions that get made in the process that will determine how balance is and how upfront that um, uh, that that appears. Sometimes, you know, you think of like a woman who puts on makeup, if she just slaps it on, you know, like like a, a, you know, a cake um, frosting, and doesn't know how to apply it correctly. It's going to come off as she's going to look like a clown, you know. Uh, and yet, someone who can apply the same amount of makeup rightly, it'll be much more natural appearing. But anyway, yeah, yeah. So, sure. so, uh, so you said you like uh, Ruth Kaladi, um in terms of uh, peated. Now, what about any sherry's? I know, like Rob's, he's big on McAllen and, and Eddington Group, and perhaps Highland Park. Um, do you have any other like sherries and whiskeys that you like? Yeah, like McAllen, I like McAllen whiskeys, but I like a very select few of them. I think a lot of what they produce is uh, kind of average, but what they do well, they do it very well. Like the McAllen, the Sherry Cast 12, the Sherry Cast 18, both really, really awesome whiskeys. Um, their whole edition series I thought were really good. Um, but then, you know, they, the fine oaks, I'm not a really big fan of. Um, what else? Like their double cast, don't really like that whiskey that much. Um, so I think McAllen, their sherry stuff, I love. Um, and then some of it's just kind of whatever. Uh, Glendronic, like Glendronic stuff. Their whole core range is great. Um, and then what else for sherry stuff? I mean, Glen Goyne's got some good stuff as well. And um, I don't know. So oh, here's, the, here's a little oh, tip. Here, here's a little tip for those who maybe you're a whiskey tuber and you're planning on having guests on. If you want to drink more during a live stream, have your guest do all the talking because he's not <laughs> drinking while he's talking. So you can do all your drinking all you want while he's talking. So while Jeremy's talking, I'm sitting there sipping and he's going to talk. And then I'll say like a, a sentence and then ask him a question. And then boom, he's back to talking, which means he's not drinking. <laughs> while, while he's talking so the way to drink more during a sh shared live stream is, is to keep him talking so you can drink while he's talking that's a, that's, that's a tip because you can because it only shows one of us at a time and so unless i could figure out a do a dual camera uh cameras at the same time so therefore i can do more drinking than jeremy does because he's doing all the talking or we could just have dead air and just drink whiskey and you know screw your viewers <laughs> <laughs> or i could just we just snap our fingers back and forth on the mic to get it. Back. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but yeah, like recently, like if you follow Rob's channel a lot, we're getting into more like um, SMWS bottling. So like a lot of like independent bottling. So it kind of depends, right? Because like as far as a, a distillery is concerned, you know, a lot of their core range stuff could be, you know, mediocre or whatever else. And then boom, you find like a single cask something that's like really, really epic. And you're like, wow, I never thought that like, you know, uh, Tomatin could like produce a whiskey like this awesome. Cause you're used to drinking like Tomatin 12 or whatever. And you know, I'm not a huge fan of Tomatin 12, but then I have this like single class Tomatin that's like 20 years old and it's like, it's just incredible stuff. So I'm kind of like picking and choosing, you know, source kind of sherry casks and not necessarily like diving into a certain distillery, I guess is what I'm saying. Right. So I'm going to put a, just a little bit of water in this one. So, at, uh, excuse me, Roy over at Aquavite did a talk about this, something I've been thinking about. Um, and the analogy I use is, so San Diego or Camp Pendleton, where our station was in the Marine Corps, up here to the Bay Area, it's a straight drive, an I-5 for eight hours. You're just nonstop. Once you get over the Altamont, and you, uh, excuse, once you get over the, uh, the Grapevine, which is a big mountain, uh, and you come down to the Central Valley, it's like there's cows and cows and fields and cows. So uh, you get a lot of road noise. There's no, well, this is back in the 80s. Um, there, there's no really good radio stations. 
there's like a religious radio station and a Mexican radio station is about it. So basically what you're doing is you listen to cassette tapes back in the day um, and, to, and to drown out the uh, road noise, you keep turning the stereo up louder and louder and louder. And But I'd get home, pull up to my parents' house, um, and then the next day I would come out, get in my truck, and when I turned on the car and the stereo was still on, I all of a sudden we whoa, blared out by the stereo. I hadn't realized how loud it had been turned up. I'd become numb to it. And I've been kind of thinking about that in terms of uh, whiskeys as well. So we're drinking essentially a cast strength. A, a lot of these have been doing a high ABV and I've kind of developed almost a palate for cast strength or high ABV whiskeys, whether they're cast strength or not, but you know, 50 plus ABV to almost become, that becomes the norm and now anytime anything's less than that, I find it less than compelling. And so now I'm kind of wanting to re sort of recalibrate my palate because these big ass whiskeys, I'm just, it's like listening to heavy metal all the time. You know, I, I'm missing the subtleties of perhaps of some other whiskeys. Um, and, and may, or maybe I need to introduce more water to it. So what are your, your thoughts on the issue? I mean, uh, and I'm like cast drinks or preferences. Do you put too much water in your whiskeys or what do, what do you do? Um, going to your point on like um, being, you know, kind of getting used to drinking cast strength. I think that you do have a point there. I think you are kind of like, you kind of get acclimated to it. And um, especially with peat, I feel like when I first started drinking peated whiskey, I felt like the presence of the peat was way more intense than I pick up now drinking it. Um, it just seems like it's, it's more kind of like balanced with the whiskey. Like as before, like when I first started drinking the Freud Coracast, it would just hit me like so hard. And now if I drink it, it seems like it's very like mellow, right? Cause you are drinking a lot of cash strength, heavily peated stuff. So yeah, definitely that for sure, um, that for sure happens without a doubt. So I even find myself helpful to transition to something else, particularly like I've heard some people into whiskey, they say, I used to drink wine now I find it doesn't have enough flavor in it. And I'm thinking, yeah, you can see someone in up there, but then I ask him, so what are you drinking when you're, when you're eating something? Um, and I find it's, even though, I mean, right now I'm, in, I'm doing a lot of videos. This is a very packed month. Next month is gonna be very, very, very packed. But I'm looking to actually sort of not, sort of cut it back by 50% for a month in terms of how much whiskeys I'm doing, spend more time with wines and then kick it up again uh in may and i'm going to do some traveling in april i was actually looking to go down to texas in april uh and travel around visiting distillery down there and then that'll i'll be able to turn may into sort of texas month the way i'm doing uh bourbon and, and, and isla um but i find um i have to mix it up to keep myself actually sh a sharp palate um i, I remember so, so bordeaux and napa valley cabernets in the 1970s were 12.5 ABV. Now, typically 14, 14.5. Some say, oh, it's global warming. Well, canopy management has changed. People's preferences in the palate and the market and all that has changed. And so they're changing the way they manage canopy. So there's getting more sunlight, you get more sunlight, you get more alcohol, you get more sugar, you get more sugar, you get more alcohol. Um, so I'm, I'm, in terms of my exploration and learning about whiskeys, when I first started off, you know, I was like this sort of like, don't put water in it because that's not the way the distiller intended it. You know, this kind of, my, my mind was more of, I want to taste it the way they intended it. Therefore, I shouldn't put water in it because what I'm doing is I'm contributing to the whiskey. And what I'm really reviewing is me plus whatever the distiller did. And now I have a different approach to it is, well, they don't necessarily intend you to be drinking it, you know, at cast strength all the time. They do intend to you to enjoy it in various ways, whether it's, and, and and however you like it, whether it's on ice or whether it's um, uh, with a little bit of water to it, they don't necessarily expect you to be drinking uh, high ABV alcohols all the time. Yeah, um, I think my philosophy with adding water to whiskey is that when I try something for the first time, I'll always probably try it neat, and then it kind of just go on feeling. Like, do I feel like maybe it would benefit some for some water, and I'll add water. And then if I do think that it benefits from the water, I'll add water every single time I drink it. I don't think there's a point on like especially when i do reviews if i'm reviewing a whiskey and i think that water improves it i'll add the water immediately um and just get the best out of that whiskey in my opinion as i'll get out of it 
Um, but yeah, just a couple drops. I'm not adding too much water to it, but definitely some whiskeys do benefit from water. Now this dark cove, I just add a couple drops in here. And it kind of just it kind of just mellows everything out. Um, kind of rounds it out for me. It doesn't give you a different profile. It just sort of gives it a different volume. I, I, I find sure. And yet it yeah. doesn't necessarily lose in its any basic essence uh, to it. No. Um, and like, there's some bourbons that I'll always add water to, like um, red bur red breast. Um, uh, I'm sorry, not red breast. Um, rare breed, um, wild turkey rare breed. I'll, I'll always add water to that whiskey because I think a little bit of water definitely helps it out. So every time I drink it, I add water. Um, Wellers, I think I like, take water pretty well, so I'll always do that there. This one. I think I like this neat better than uh, than water with the dark the dark cove. Okay, so let me ask you a quick now. So my approach to whiskeys has changed a little bit because I went from there's a difference between the mentally preparing for. I'm, I'm going to belch here in a minute. Excuse me. Um, <laughs> just warning. So uh, there's a difference between doing something for an exam. Doing something casually, like you say, while you're watching a hockey game or you're watching television or reading a book or sitting by the fire and, you know, petting the dog while you're reading a book and smoking a pipe or a cigar or something versus examining something and doing something for a video. You're sort of being um, more analytical, more on stage. So with that, my first approach to whiskeys was purely for exams, purely in a student mode purely in a test and examination mode. And I still, still a lot of that. I mean, I have study in, in, in the title of my uh, channel, but if I, I noticed later it affected how I viewed other whiskey tubers. I say like uh, Scott and Bart, probably my favorite, no offense to everybody else, but they're probably my favorites. Um, but when I first saw them, they were so they goofing around and being goofy I didn't take them seriously because they're being such goofballs. I didn't find them to be academic and they don't pretend to be. And so I just kind of looked at them. I kind of go, eh, whatever. And then left later on, I came back and you know, I, I really love those guys love meeting up with those guys. I feel like we're brothers separated from a, a you know, another mother, right. you know, a, a mom who likes to drink whiskey. Um, uh, and so, but m my view of them and whiskey changed because my approach and my intention and my mindset changed because I got out of steady mode. I got out of exam mode. So with that, and what I'm getting to is, so you were enjoying whiskeys and you're doing this thing for the Toronto Whiskey Society. Yep. Now you're doing, now you're doing videos. Have you noticed any difference in your approach to whiskeys, a different, slightly different mindset in terms of your approach to it or anything like that? now that you're having to be on in front of a camera and all that kind of thing? My approach to reviewing is the exact same. I still go through, take all my notes, um, usually try a whiskey multiple times before I go through the review. Um, I'll usually, if I'm opening a bottle for the, new, for the first time, I'll take it down, you know, I'll spend like a month with it maybe, or if I don't have that much time, at least get, you know, four or five good tasting nights out of it write all my notes down. Um, and then essentially I just try the whiskey again on camera. If I pick up anything different, I'll add to it. But for the most part, I've got all my notes down. I know my score. I've got everything kind of pre done before I start shooting. And then if there's anything kind of different, I'll kind of add to it or take something away at that point in time. But essentially my process is the exact same as far as breaking down a whiskey, getting the notes done, trying it on different days at different times, um, experimenting with water, all that kind of thing. So that process for reviewing for me is still the exact same. Doing it in front of camera obviously is a lot more difficult. Um, I've got millions of hours of bloopers and coughs and stumbles and ums and why well, still, still, those still get through, but it's a lot easier just typing it out and uh, spell checking it than it is to uh, record a live or record a video and sending it out. But process, reviewing, um, breaking down the whiskey, the exact same. So I want to say hello to Peter White, who's in the house. And there may be some others that are now watching that I missed. So, but so what I'm getting sort of getting at. So you're into whiskey before you were doing the Toronto Whiskey Society. 
But were you being super analytical about your whiskeys before you were right? I mean, because then you got into writing and then you got into doing video. But were you, were you that analytical about your whiskeys from the beginning then? Um, no, I don't think I turned into that more analysis of the whiskey until I started reviewing for Toronto Whiskey Society. Before that, it would just be me and a couple of buddies just kind of drinking something, you know, what do you get? What are your, you know, what are you picking up from this and kind of bouncing tasty notes off of each other. Um, I never wrote anything down prior to that. It wasn't until I started, you know, okay, I'll start reviewing whiskey that I started writing stuff down. And I think actually that kind of developed my palate a bit more. I felt that if I picked up a note and I wrote it down, I would start to like visualize in my head and kind of get like an idea, like a catalog and you know, like a library of notes and what to expect in different whiskeys. Um, and it wasn't really until I started reviewing it and writing that stuff down that kind of like, okay, like sherry cask, you're expected to get, you know, look for these kind of notes or an ex bourbon cask, look for these type of notes. And that all kind of came when I started doing reviews. So one of the things, I, I, I get to know people. So I grew up with four brothers, three older, one younger. And I'm very, very, very different from my other brothers. We have a similar sense of humor so that when we get together holidays, you know, it's a unique, Eric, it's a unique weight brothers sense of humor and joking around and stuff. But other than that, academically, in terms of the arts and everything else, we're very, 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 very different. Very different interests. And I've always benefited from my brothers because I've taken an interest in their academic back. We're all book nerds. We're all, we're all, we're all bookophiles or whatever, uh, bibliophiles, um, and very academic, but very diverse in their backgrounds. But getting to know them and what they're interested in and getting and, and knowing, growing up with my brothers, I see parallels between what their academic interests are, what their hobbies are, and everything else. They kind of fit within you know a certain personality and so i find people i know in the wine world or whiskey world that okay so i'm very eclectic in my music and i'm very eclectic in my whiskey and i'm very eclectic in my food i'm very eclectic i'm just a it that same sort of theme sort of carries on with all my interests versus people i know they just like only this beer this wine maybe this whiskey this kind of movies they just like this genre of movies so that sort of similar approach to things tends to carry across on things. So what, and so by asking people, what are your favorite movies? What are your favorite music? What are the other hobbies outside of wine or whiskey? It kind of gives me an insight into their approach to wine and whiskey as well. So other than whiskey and beer, what do you say are your other sort of passion and interest you got? I know you, know, you said you like hockey. Um, yeah, like sports, um, big into sports, playing sports, watching sports. I work for a sports television network. Um, so I play hockey twice a week. I play soccer, golf, um, tennis sometimes. So really kind of sports orientated. Um, and then, yeah, watching sports. I like to bet on sports. So that's more like my focus outside of whiskey. Um, other than that, that pretty much takes the cake. I mean, <laughs> between working, playing sports and drinking whiskey, that's almost like a uh, four full time what, job. So. What about music? So the first band I really got into was in elementary school was the Beatles. Uh, no, it was not in elementary school in the 1960s. Uh, <laughs> so I get to do the Beatles when I was, so I was in the, I was in high in elementary school uh, 1972 to 1977 or whatever. Um, but I introduced the Beatles and then going to junior high, I got introduced to Rush, a band I'm sure you're familiar with. Yeah, uh, I love Rush. So we're talking about late 1970s, 78, 79, and then in the 80s, got into Iron Maiden, Jewish Priest, Motorhead, Scorpions, Metallica, you know, all these uh, metal bands of the 1980s. And then after that, got into classical guitar and then classical music in general, and then opera, and then contemporary jazz, and then just kind of expand from there. So, so what about your musical interests? Do you have any, you said you like Rush, any, any other kind of musical interests? Well, I don't like classic rock. Like I love listening to classic rock. Um, I kind of grew up in like that like late 90s, early 2000s, like punk rock scene where I listened to a lot of stuff on like Fat Records, a lot of like California punk rock bands, um, 
like no effects, um, strung out, good riddance, propaganda or Canadian band, like that kind of genre of stuff. There was a big music scene where I grew up um, here in Ontario and we'd always see those bands come through. Like Blink-182, if you go to like the more like mainstream stuff, like Blink-182, that kind of like genre of music. Um, so that, and then now it's more kind of like, I would say indie rock is where I like listen to a lot of stuff now. Um, more kind of into that genre now. So um, going to a concert, Mother Mother, they're a huge band out of, um, out of BC. Love them, seeing them this month. So yeah, that's kind of where I am. I grew up, my parents were huge into like 90s pop music. So I got bombarded with like, I don't know, Madonna and like Whitney Houston and all of that stuff growing up. And I know the lyrics to all those songs, which is <laughs> kind of like, you know, good and bad, I guess. But my parents just played that stuff hard. Like they were big time 90s, like everything. So I got a lot of that. So kind of everything with music, like I like every genre of music except for country. I cannot stand country. I don't like it at all. Um, it hurts my ears to listen to, but anything else, like I could listen to like classical to like gangster rap and I could enjoy all that in between, just not country. Don't play me any country music. So country music, if they complain too much, I'm not a big fan of country music, but I grew up here in Johnny Cash and I feel like it's kind of weird. You become, there are certain things, they're in your life, your whole life, and you feel like somehow you're related to them. Like I feel like Johnny Cash was one of my uncles. See, like Johnny Cash, I can make. I I like Johnny Cash a lot, but I right. would consider that I wouldn't consider that like what I think of country music, right? I think of country music as someone with a guitar singing yeah. about pickup yeah. trucks. Yeah. yeah, like pickup trucks oh. and heartbreak, right? It's like that's. Right. Oh my truck just died. Oh my, my oh my oh my dog just died and my truck got a flat. My wife ran away, but that's okay because I still got my beer. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That stuff I cannot stand. But Johnny Cash, I wouldn't I don't think of country music when I think Johnny Cash. I think more like I guess it's a little country, but it's more like classic rock in my opinion. Right. So John actually and kind of rush is that same sort of people call them progressive, whatever, but they they're in rock, they're within their own sort of niche. They're not they're not heavy metal, they don't fit anything else. And Johnny Cash could play with rock and roll. He could do Elvis. He could play with um, country. And he's done some covers of actually of some 90s uh, rock bands. So, yeah, Johnny Cash. And he had an influence sort of across the board. And I think he even won rock awards as well. My, he might be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, if I recall correctly. But anyway, yeah, sort of in the same dish. But, yeah, I'm sort of the same thing. Country music that complains too much. Although, here's the funny thing. I might not – I don't listen to a lot of bagpipe. Black, 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 blah, 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 any bagpipe music. But when you're in Scotland and you're driving, you're so coming back heading south to the lowlands and you're, you're looking at the green hills, tuning into uh, bagpipe music, listen to bagpipe music, it sort of fits. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the same yep. thing, if you go out to the, if you're in the Midwest, uh, I was in uh, Missouri one time, Missouri, and I rented a pickup truck. And I'm, there's a lot of cornfields and whatever. And I turned into a country music station with, dar, 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 you know, that kind of thing. And that's exactly, I feel like, <laughs> I, 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 I was driving. I'm like, yeah, that's right. I'm yeah, like, I guess the kind of, like, yeah, the music fits the mood, right? If you're, yeah, if you're in there, then sure. Like for St. Patrick's Day, like I'll just blare the Dropkick Murphys. And they use like, I love that style, like that Irish style of music. Um, I love it. So Hoyt just says, uh, give Don Ellis a try. Never heard of him. Oh, innovative jazz composer who died too young, began fusion jazz, got to go. Uh, great chat tonight. Uh, Hoyt, thank you very much for tuning in. We met up at the uh, Scotch Test uh, fifth anniversary. I got into contemporary jazz when I was in San Diego. I was stationed at Kimpel, one of my uh, roommates in the barracks was into contemporary jazz. Um, and San Diego is sort of the, you know, Kenny G is a little too much, uh, but uh, San Diego is sort of the capital of uh, contemporary jazz. So for me, Again, the same thing. Mood. What? What's your favorite wine? What's your favorite whiskey? Depends on my mood. Yeah, you can't. You, you can't answer the question. What's your favorite? What's your favorite whiskey? It all depends, right? Like some nights you are want a peat bomb. Some nights you just want to chill with a bourbon. It's all kind of. It's all changing all the time, and it always varies. So when I'm driving over a bridge, going into the city, going to San Francisco, and it's night, and you have the city lights, I kind of like listen to contemporary jazz. It just fits the scene, you know. Um, I drive around with um, 
almost like uh, like uh, movie music playing in the background. I'm driving as if I'm living in a movie. Yeah. <laughs> when I'm driving sometimes. And then if you watch my videos, particularly now, I found a it's called Epic Sound. Uh, the first month is free. I'm, I'm not. I don't get paid by them. First month is free, and then after they pay a few bucks a month. And they have music for every genre, every style, every speed, every mood you can think of. So I've been incorporating that more into my videos, but it's changing according to what mood am I, I'm in for the making the video, recording the video, or what mood I want to play. So I've already created my intros and stuff for Bourbon Month. And when I think of bourbon, I think of Kentucky. I think of more of the Midwest. I think of more of out in the country. And so my music's going to change for Bourbon Month a bit. Yeah. Little um, like blue, like little like bluegrass kind of music going on, right? There. Or, or more of a southern rock or st stuff like that. Yeah. So, hey, most turtles in the house. I how you doing? I haven't seen you in a while. Um, so same thing with whiskeys and music is it, it very much depends on the mood I'm in or the mood I want to be in because music and whiskey can change or watching a movie can also change my mood as well. You know, I, I'm not into this, but if people feel like you know crying and so they're gonna watch a sad movie or a sappy movie with a girlfriend or whatever like that you know you know they'll watch a, a sad you know drama what i'm not my thing i'm more of into action films but like so i've been listening to the soundtrack for um uh oh john wick have you seen the john right. wick movies yes love john wick movies so keanu reeves he's he's not the greatest actor in the world but he ha he fits his this niche of this action kick-ass film he does really really good job at and the music and the mood is similar to parts of the Matrix, in terms of like the bar scenes and stuff like that. So I love, I, if I'm on my way to work and I'm getting out in the traffic and I turn on the, the John Wick soundtrack and listen to it on my way to work, I always feel like, man, I feel like I should be putting out, pulling out my gat and going. <laughs> <laughs> on the you know, Reeves is actually very impressive in that. I saw behind the scenes of him training, like gun training for the John Wick movie. And he is a badass. Like he's pulling out, reloading clips as running through this like um, target practice maze kind of thing. And he kills it like really, really good. Really, very impressed. Um, yeah, he's he's for real both in the guns and in, in firearms and also martial arts. So he knows kung fu. So I, right. So I spent twenty <laughs> years. Whoa, I know kung fu. <laughs> I know kung fu. So I spent twenty years in front of law enforcement. I was a firearm instructor. I was an NRA firearm uh, firearm instructor, a BSIS certified firearms instructor, and all that stuff. So I know a little bit about about firearms and and shooting people. And I've actually seen that same clip on YouTube. Um, and doing the difference between just shooting a still target and then doing uh combat towns or stuff like that, but yeah, he's for real. It does really good. Uh, I'm, I'm I hope he never does what um, what Bruce Lee's son did, he accidentally got killed uh, by a blank. Um, oh, yeah, uh, uh, Brandon Lee was it? I think it was Brandon Lee, anyway. So, I like watching movies, but when it comes to his the way he says his lines, it's I'm not that big on it, but still. I'm, so the next uh, movie is com it's coming out in May, actually. The third John Wick film is, is coming out in May. Looking oh, forward. Zach Andrews. He, I was going to mention that in uh, in Constantine, um, Keanu Reeves, he drinks our big 10-year-old in Constantine. I thought that was really cool and kind of like fitting to that character, too. I thought it was awesome. That's funny because I have that on video, and I don't remember that. I'll have to go back and, I'll have to go back and watch it. Hey, I want to say hello to Whiskey Shenanigans, formerly known as Bourbon Shenanigans. I'm going to have him on next month uh, during Bourbon Month. So to re resurrect his old uh, identity as uh, a bourbon man. Oh yeah, the crow was was the name of the movie, which uh, I think was Brandon Lee, or I think he had two sons. I'm not sure which one. One of the anyway, one of the Lee sons got killed or not. Anyway, better topic. Um, so we got about seven minutes left before we're gonna turn on to the uh, whiskey dick and uh, bourbon scene. So do you have any current future plans? What do you want to do with the channel? Where you want to go? Or ideas of what you want to do? I'm going to start doing my own lives. Um, my first live actually is going to be this Tuesday at 9 o'clock uh, p.m. Eastern time. So check that out. Um, on the channel right now, I got a giveaway still going on. If you check out my top five unicorn whiskeys, there you can uh, leave a comment, get into a chance to win a sample of Pappy Van Winkle 20-year-old. So that's open until I think the 18th of this month. So you can go write a comment on there. Um, and yeah, that other than the live, um, I got lots of whiskey to review, so it's just a matter of deciding what I'm going to do next. But uh, I mean, the channel's blowing up. It's uh, been really good so far. So yeah. So you going live solo, or are you having a guest on? I'm going to bring Rob in. Yeah, Whiskey in the Six is going to come in, and uh, I think it's kind of suiting that like you know, the first time I go live, he's there because 
I kind of went live on his channel. So yeah, me and me and Rob are gonna we got a lot of fun stuff planned. Um, lots of giveaways, of course, as always. So yeah, tune in for that. So there is a challenge, and it depends on the individual. So someone who's on the radio, you know, I have an hour, 20 minutes is spent in commercials. And so they can go through the notes and go through paper. They can take a break. They can take a whiz. They can drink some water. They can talk to their producer whatever. But if you're doing um, a live YouTube, you don't have commercials. So you better have enough content. And I would say Mash and Drum, uh, Jason, he does. He has a really good format. I wouldn't necessarily – his style isn't my same because I'm a different person. Um, but he has a really, really he, he maps out really, really well in terms of uh, doing this show. So it's a challenge doing it by yourself in order to have, make sure you have enough content where you can keep talking and, and not run out and, and not just sit there and try to look, hoping everybody who's watching gives you enough stuff to respond to, but to be able to carry on topic wise for a whole hour or, or half an hour, however long you do it. Um, but I, I wish you all the best. I think you'll uh, do really, really well. And uh, you and Rob are, I mean, obviously a, a natural uh, give and take uh, comedy team as well as really uh, good at doing uh, whiskey reviews as well. Yeah, sure. I mean, if there's any like blank air, we just make fun of each other. Or we make fun of people in chat or they make fun of us. So it's a, it's a good back and forth between uh, us and the whole whiskey community. All righty. So um, I want a couple of minutes to, I need to grab a quick bite to eat so I can tune into the whiskey deck, catch the beginning of that. Um, so tomorrow I'll post an announcement for it uh, on my channel. Um, myself and the whiskey friend, uh, we already pre-recorded it. I did some editing to it. Um, so that will be uploaded and it'll post as a premiere. Hopefully both Alan and I, I will be there. Hopefully Alan will be able to join in too and the, uh, join in on the chat. Should be 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, um, 11 o'clock p.m. Uh, in I think in the UK and, and Europe, somewhere around there. So hope you guys will tune in uh, for that. Alan, just a really, really neat guy, a real humble guy. Um, if you guys haven't already subscribed to uh, Sipper Social, I always have to slow down when I say your channel's name. <laughs> yeah. you, don't want, you don't want to say Stripper Social Club. That's a different channel. Or, or you invert the social on the Sippers. Uh, <laughs> right. Right. Um, but anyway, so if you guys haven't subscribed already, please do. Before we go out, and that's a question I, I meant to ask, where did the name Sippers Social Club come from? Um, well, obviously just sippers with like sipping whiskey, um, and then the social club. I don't know where I got that. Um, originally it was just me and my buddies, uh, from high school. We just had like a chat going, uh, like a, a Facebook chat where we just like post what bottle we bought recently. And I, we just named it sipper social club. And that was where we would just discuss whiskey with each other. So I just kept that name and made my channel. Cool. So yeah, I, it's good that you did no offense to all our fellow whiskey troopers out there. You didn't go with uh, Whiskey Jeremy or Jeremy Whiskey. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> you did pick a unique name. And I think for branding wise, it works really well, as well as the potential to turn into something bigger that's an actual club, maybe memberships, people can buy things, maybe, you know, who knows? You can expand it to an actual membership kind of thing and do something more with it uh, as well. Yeah, and I didn't want to limit it to just whiskey because, you know, I like drinking other spirits as, too, as well, like rum, um, you know, cognacs, armagnacs. I'm not really big into them, but I think I will see myself in the future, like exploring that avenue a little bit more as well. All righty. So, hey, uh, all right. So i got just a couple more minutes. Nick, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Um, I'm going to put a link at the end of this for those who are watching this on the replay. So you can go over to uh, Jeremy's channel as well as there should be a one down below. Um, if you haven't already, please give a thumbs up uh, and subscribe to this channel. All righty, Jeremy, thank you very much uh, for coming on. I greatly appreciate it. And uh, cheers, brother. Thank you for having me. It was a great time. Thanks, Eric. Cheers. Cheers.